Fishing the DMV has big plans for the future, but to get there, I need your help. In order to keep Fishing the DMV alive through 2024 and beyond, we need a four six dollars a month, which is less than a pack of Senkos or a jackhammer chatterbait. All Patreon members will receive 5% off all of their orders to Jake's Bait and Tackle each and every month. You will also get 10% off all of your orders to our newest sponsor, Tiger Crankbaits, who won best in show at the Richmond Fishing Expo. You will also gain membership to our private Facebook group com community where we talk about fishing, what's coming up, and you'll be entered into weekly prize giveaways, private live streams and videos, and so much more. If you would like to see Fishing the DMV continue to bring you content, please think about joining. Link in the episode description. Thank you so much. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Fishing the DMV. I'm your host, Thomas Ahrens. And today we have, we've already had the winner of the BFL on the Piedmont division on the Shenandoah division, or I'm sorry, let me try that again. So we've already had the winner on for the Smith Mountain Lake Piedmont division BFL from the boater side of things. And I was fortunate enough to get hooked up with this guy, Matt Russell, who won the co-angler side with 16 pounds on the dot with five fish, taking home over $2,000. Matt, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. So as always, before we get into this, into the tournament itself, like how did you get into fishing? Well, my dad's always had a boat in uh, Ocean City. So we've always been saltwater fishermen. We do a lot of tuna, marlin, mahi fishing. And pretty much two years ago, one of our motors went down. So I had to find somehow to fish and just started bass fishing and fell in love with it pretty much and had to go get into tournaments right away because I'm pretty competitive. When you mean a boat for saltwater, I think like it can get kind of crazy. Were you talking like a hundred foot, like, like yacht? Were you talking a 10 footer? Like what, what was it? So my dad has a 28 foot scout. And I also fish on a 36 foot uh, Jersey Cape. It's like a sport fishing boat. So Whew. between those two boats, uh, we fish pretty much every weekend. Dude, that's awesome. God, you have a, you have a <laughs> life. What is, like, oh, I just know ocean city for like the cars, the beaches, it's a little greasy. Um, I, I don't know. And this is my fault, of course, but like, I don't know a lot about the fishing scene there. What, what is that like? Yeah, so that's pretty much the opposite. I only go there to fish because we live two and a half hours away in uh, Cecil County. So I usually waking up 1 a.m., leaving the house, getting to the boat, 3 a.m., we're leaving 4 a.m., and then 70, 80 miles out to get. Ocean City is one of the farthest places to get to the canyon. Uh, we have a far run, 70, 80 miles to get to the drop off, which it goes from 300 feet to the canyons, which 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 deep. Damn. So, what is yeah, we do a lot of sea bass, flounder inshore, and then when we go deep, tuna, mahi, marlin, anything that bites. Damn. Like, that's so freaking cool. I, I don't even know where to start. We could almost do a whole episode on that, and I, 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 I'll kill my listeners for doing that, but we're going to dabble into this a little bit. So getting into that, that that is like completely different from bass fishing when you're thinking like if you catch a four pounder and yeah. it takes five seconds to bring it in that's a big deal versus like what, I mean, what's the biggest thing you've caught in salt water honestly uh this past december we caught almost a 400 pound bluefin tuna probably like 380. so yeah the best part is i forgot the fighting the good fighting belts in my truck so we had to fight it for like two hours and 45 minutes on just a regular belt which no straps, all arms. But we got it done. What What is that fight like? Just holding on to like a school bus underwater, pretty much. They just lay there under under, and just go straight down. Two that's it, that's yeah. insane. Good Lord. Like, is that the best fighting like saltwater? Because I know like, like so yeah, example uh, is. I'd rather catch Marlin or like a Mahi because they go up to the top and jump. And then they get tired and it's pretty much over. Me, I kind of, you know, I invite other people on the boat, so they reel in the tuna. My my job is to gaff them pretty much, get them in the boat. 
It sounds so, like you get bored with that. Honestly, it's like, ah, oh, it's just another no. 200 pounder. It's like, oh, well, <laughs> no, see what I love is like, I do all the rigs, all the knots, the crimps, the hooks, all the spread. So I got nine, 10 rods out. So when we catch fish, you know, I call it those fish cause it's, it was my spread. You know, I did everything is it's, it's rewarding like that to where bass fishing. So like every cast, you know, you catch one. It's just, it's sweet when you catch one. I love it. That is true. Well, <laughs> there's a lot of cool things from saltwater, especially when it comes to like tackle, floor carb. Floor carbon came basically from saltwater. Is there any kind of knots or leader knots that you've picked up from saltwater that you could like use in bass fishing that no one else is using? Mm, everybody's using an FG knot when we're going braid to fluoro. But most of the time I'm crimping stuff I'm using like 100 pound fluorocarbon, 130 pound. And just crimping it because crimp stronger than a knot. Really? I didn't know that. That's cool. Huh. Let's say. Do, does that actually go onto the reel or is that like just the leader? So usually the FG knot is so you can actually get it onto the reel, correct? So is a crimp? Yeah, so oh. FG knot would be like when we're using spinners out there, bottom fishing, not when we're tuna. Tuna is all big gear. Okay. Big line. We're running 80 pound mono off the reel to you know 100 pound liters why mono why mono instead of braid out of curiosity uh cheaper gotcha because yeah i haven't heard of mono being used a lot before until you just brought it up well, so, there's some big 50s so i mean it's 500 yards of mono so it's holy god <laughs> it's a, you got more than enough to where you can just strip it and buy it every couple of years instead of you know, buying six miles of braid because there's so much more that the the, the real holds. Mm. But, I didn't even think of that. Oh, wow. That's interesting. So it's like it, if we're deep dropping like a swordfish, yeah, we're using braid. So we have a lot more line. But, what is a deep drop for a swordfish? Because the <laughs> deepest I fish is like 40 feet before. And I think that was a big deal. Uh, Pretty much 500 to 1500. <laughs> Shit. Yeah. God damn, that is deep. Like, like, are you are you using an electric reel then, or like, are you just having some poor sucker hand crank that thing up like six miles? No, electric reel. But we don't really do a lot of that. It's mostly tuna fish trolling, uh, looking for anything in the water for some mahis. So you have this really cool saltwater background, fishing Ocean City. When did you decide, like, all right, I want to get into the bass fishing, and then you're going to get into it, great. But if you're dealing with, like, tuna tackle, did you have to go out and just buy all this bass stuff? Like, what was that transition yeah. like for you? So, yeah, I didn't even have a spinning rod small enough to catch a bass. So I had to go out and buy everything new. Uh, pretty much two years ago, one of our motors went down, so I couldn't fish a lot. And we just moved to Pennsylvania by this uh, small lake. It's electric motor only lake. And I, have, I had a John boat already. So just started taking it out and going fishing. I started in August and just went every day. Pretty much get off work and go fishing. And pretty competitive. So I jumped in the first, the BFL the next month in September, which was the two day Potomac. That was, uh, they kept us in the creek because of the hurricane. So it was a rough first experience, but we started out strong the following year, which was last year. I got a 12th at Kerr Lake. What clicked? Mm, well, I have one of my friends. He's a really good bass fisherman. I'll say he's my mentor, uh, Joey Murphy at Dirty Murph Baits. He makes uh, custom crankbaits, custom painted crankbaits and all that. We went to high school together. We've always been friends, but I've been the saltwater guy. He's always been bass. So once I made the switch, just I'm texting him every day, a million questions. What's this? What do I do here? What, what would you do here? And that's pretty much it. Just a lot of YouTube research, watching your interviews, all the podcasts. So going from Kerr, you you hit a, you crack a top twelve, which is you know that's good enough for a check and yeah. probably giving you a little bit of confidence. Yeah. I'm like, oh yeah, this is easy. It's like, <laughs> oh yeah. Which it wasn't. 
No, but but it's confidence. It's gaining confidence to believe in your skills because a yeah. lot of it is, you know, positive mental, mental attitude being on the water. So you go from Kerr. Did you have any experience on Smith to start the year? Oh. All these lakes, the first time I've ever been to. Even this year when I got the win, that was my first cast of the year. I haven't even went fishing all year. Dude. It's too cold. I don't have a true. boat. I have a John boat. And the lake by my house doesn't open until April because it's like a private lake. That's what I was going to ask, too. Is like, is there like a restriction on that bad boy? Yeah, yeah which so, is stupid. So pretty much I'm cooped up in the house. And the first tournament on the schedule close enough to drive is March, Smith Mountain Lake. And I love that lake because it's loaded with bass. I ended up catching a limit my first year there, but didn't place. Caught a bunch of one and a half pounders, unfortunately. But it was fun. What would you consider your strengths are as a bass angler going into this first event of the year? Uh, I would say, uh, I would say casting. I am a pretty good caster. I'm not going to lie. Somehow I just practice a lot and I can skip the chatterbait under those docks. I can skip, you know, pretty much anything pretty good. So I was catching a lot of fish deep to where my boater wasn't trying some spots under a dock. Well, and that's actually really good to get into it. So let's say you're, you're driving down, let's say Friday night or, or what have you to get there and you're getting up your gear before you even make a cast Saturday. What are you thinking about going into this tournament? Did you get to talk to your boater? Yes, I always call them the night before, as soon as I get the, the number and, you know, ask them if he's been practicing. Uh, this guy, this past tournament, Smith Mountain Lake, he lives 15 minutes from there. So he said he had a bunch of spots. Uh, he said he also fishes very fast. And if we're fishing docks, it's going to suck for me because his angle and how fast he goes. So. He said he caught him on spinner bait and a crank bait. So right there I knew drop shot, shaky head, ain't working. Because once he gets he's gonna get, you know, antsy and power fishing and just start cruising, which happened. So I knew I needed the chatter bait on and jerk bait, spinner bait just in case. So some some fast moving stuff. How much where did you gain your confidence with a chatter bait? Because that's a very interesting thing, I think, to throw at Smith depending on where you are in the lake is how clear it is. So yeah. is this like their first time ever throwing it or have you had no, experience? My, like I said, my friend, we fish on Chesapeake Bay a lot and it's just a killer in the grass. Oh, okay. Gotcha. And so where I'm hearing a lot of these podcasts and people talking about like my boater talking about spinner bait, I don't want to throw the same as him. Not a lot of people use the chatter bait. So I wanted something a little different, but kind of same deal. And you know, you know, that tournament is, it's all going to be bait fish. So I had every size swim bait tied on pretty much to tiny to big. Uh, it's you wouldn't be wrong in putting some money on those uh, on those on the roulette wheel because that lake is yeah. renowned for its yeah. swim bait bite. It's really consistent. Yeah, I gave the mag draft a few casts, some skips under the dock, but chatter bait. Oh, like I said, well, it didn't really go with how the day started. I caught. Well, let's, let's go for yeah. it. So. He right away he tells me we're gonna go up on some rocks, and uh, so we pull up and he's throwing a crankbait and I catch a three and a half pounder on like my fourth cast. So less than a minute I got one in the boat. So I'm already feeling like I'm calm, not even thinking about anything. I'm just having a good old time out there. Uh, keep fishing. I get another one probably like an hour later. So he still doesn't have anything and. He starts getting antsy and we're start cruising now. We're hauling ass dock to dock to dock. <laughs> so, and so then what time is it now? You got two. What time is it? Got two. It's probably nine o'clock. Oh yeah. That's awesome. That's plenty of time. Yeah. So I was feeling good at that point. And then another hour goes by. It's like 10, 11. He catches one, which is a good one. And then, I catch a, a pretty nice like four pounder uh, on a jerk bait. Uh, so in my head, I'm like, all right, I got three good ones already. I'm, I'm good. 
I just need two more fish. I got plenty of time. I'm, I'm feeling good. You got Everything plenty of time, through. dude. I mean, yeah, I mean, I think that third fish is always like, like the tip of the roll, the top of the roller coaster. Like once you get three, you feel like, okay, I can get two. <laughs> yeah. Um, now you, you mentioned the jerk bait, you caught one on the chatter bait. Was the chatter bait a dock fish and the jerk bait? Were you working that around the dock or just casting it into the ether? Uh, the jerk bait I pulled out because we kind of pulled up a little far from a rock, like the rock bank. We're pretty far from it. So it, I knew he was fishing deep. So that was the only thing I had and just threw the jerk bait and give them the old Jacob Wheeler cadence and bam. Dude, well, I actually awesome. caught the big striper, big striper first. So I was like, it's, it's huge. It's huge. And he's like, it's probably a striper. I'm like, damn, they got stripers here. <laughs> so catch a big striper. It's raining so hard. I can't even unlock my phone to take a selfie with it. So it's, it's pouring, throw it back in, get it. And then, same spot, jerking, jerking, a nice four pounder. So, mm. oh yeah, we're we're doing pretty good. So you got three three in the box at this point. It's about you said ten, eleven o'clock. Yeah. What does your so boater then, do now? So then my boater goes on a rally. He starts hitting these spots and just boom, boom, boom. He's got four in the boat, and I have three. And then it's like probably twelve o'clock, twelve thirty and pull up to the spot and boom i hit this giant bass of five five uh five pounds six ounce which Jesus. i want to take bass with what were you doing were you guys still offshore uh we were cruising dock to dock okay but he wasn't throwing at the, in the banks in between each dock and mm -hmm. so he would make his cast at the dock and start hauling ass so i would just cast one at the middle of the bank in between the docks so as we drove by it, we just reel it in nice and slow, and, and that's when I hit the big five pounder. <laughs> that's really smart. Like, what made you decide to do that? Was it something that you saw, or just like instinct? Mm -hmm. That's a really good idea. I I, I saw in one interview the guy said uh, just keep casting as a co angler, just keep casting. So as long as you keep your lure in the water at all times, and I was just watching where he was casting, just casting as far away. He was moving so fast, we would you know, two casts in like a 30 yard stretch. So I had plenty of room to cast where he wasn't. And that was on the chatterbait or the jerkbait? Chatterbait. Chatterbait? Yeah, jerkbait I only threw for a little bit because that spot, we were deeper. Dude, that's, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which you I, know. I would like to know where that spot was so I can go back, but I don't know anything about that lake or where the hell we were. It's a big lake and it can be discombobulating if you, if you don't have a GPS unit. And it was pouring rain, so I was just closing my eyes the whole time. Every time we started hauling ass, so. yeah, yeah, that's yeah. It was. <laughs> I'm, I'm it, like, wasn't pleasant. <laughs> it wasn't pleasant, and I've already told the story that I was down there, and I was with a friend's boat, and we were going to fish the day, take some photos of some of the guys that were fishing the tournament, and we woke up, and like his bilge wasn't on, and so his boat was flooded so bad that the Budweiser cans that he had in his boat were floating. <laughs> And we were like, nah, let's just pull this on the trailer and let's just go, let's just go home. Yeah, it, it was, was not wet. fun. <laughs> so wet, my life jacket went off. Standing there, just winding, and then boom, the right side goes. Oh. <laughs> and I'm like, shit. What the? So that's how wet it was. It, it went off. I would have dropped a load in my pants. That that would not be <laughs> not be. My fun. boater. It was funny. He was trying to take a picture. He couldn't get it. It was so wet. Everything was so wet. We, he couldn't unlock a phone or nothing. Dude, nah, it was it just been a funny picture. It would have been a really funny it was picture. One side, <laughs> especially with your winning bag, that would have been hilarious. Yeah. What, but so at this point, that what what when you catch that five pounder, what time of the day is it? Mm -hmm. Roughly, probably twelve forty five to one ish, somewhere like that. So you got, and are you the early got, flight? There was only three flights. We were the middle flight. There was only eighty nine boats. It was so, really small. It was, it was small. really small. I don't know if that was because of the weather. I'm think it has, I think it's because of the weather. Cause I looked at the stats from the last BFL this time of year and it had over 115 or something like that. It was like, it was, it was pretty healthy, but yeah. so it's so about then, noon. Yeah. So we got, yeah, pretty much like an hour or two, I guess what I forget what time we have to come in, but somewhere around three ish, something two forty five. Yeah. Two forty five, and you got four. So got four. So I got, you know, feeling good. 
two hours at least to catch one more and everything's going well. So I wasn't really sweating it, honestly. Because you got to check at this point, right? Do you feel like you got to check at this point? Yeah, I knew I was in definitely check range with four and I had four good ones. Like I didn't even have any small ones. I have pretty good ones. Uh, I just needed one more. And my boater kept saying, he's like, man, we get you one more. You, you're going to win this thing. I was like, I don't know, man. But I did a bad job at counting how big my fish were. So, so yeah, we both have four times going by. And long story short, we got 20 minutes to a weigh-in. Both have four fish. He's like, all right, I got this one spot by weigh-ins. He's like, if smallmouth are going to be there, he's like, we should be able to catch them. And pull right up, and he catches a smallmouth, like three-pounder, crankbait right away. So I'm like, oh, yeah, I, this is my chance. So the old chatterbait out there, bam, nice two, three-pounder, two-and-a-half, three-pounder, 20 minutes to go. We have high five and just haul ass in. It was awesome. Dude, that's so, really cool. And it's your first time at the lake, too. Well, I fished it the year before. So oh, before. right, 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 right. Second time at I the lake. Yeah, I did catch a limit, but I didn't get a check. That was the April where people were catching big bags. April was stupid. April last year was like the perfect time to be down there to yeah. be doing that. Yeah, Dude, I had a limit and didn't even cash. So, <sighs> wow. So, you know, we get to the weigh in. You got a limit. What's going through your head before you get across the scales? Uh, I usually like check in with like my wife and see what the top 10 is because she's always watching the live feed but couldn't unlock my phone it was so wet so i didn't know what i had I, my my head i thought i had like 13 pounds so I, I had five and all five good ones i knew i was in the top 10 honestly i had to i had to be up there but when i got on the scale or the stage and he said 16 i was like damn that i think i'm good because uh, everybody else i was seeing and talked to nobody had five it was like two, three, one. And what's funny is like I just I have right now on my other screen as like I have the stats pulled up. So if you had you had sixteen one, that puts you like sixteen to fourteenth place, roughly. In the boater side, yeah. Yeah, like yeah, like yeah. So there's a tie at sixteenth place at sixteen two, sixteen two, sixteen four around there. That's pretty damn good from the back of the boat. Like that's not just like that's a respectable weight. Shit. Yeah. Yeah, it was sweet. It was an awesome day. It uh, it was awesome. Now, I, dude, that's just awesome. Really? So, with that done, and I guess before we, we get on to like some other things. Yeah, so actually, the last fish ended up not even mattering because we were sweating it. The last fish I caught twenty minutes ago, so I ended up winning by four pounds, and that one was like a three pounder. So, even though I would have won with four fish, so it's pretty cool. When it's your time, it's your time. Like you just can't do any wrong. I, it, it really is. Yeah. And yeah, like I said, my my uh, one mentor, uh, Dirk Murph Bates, he uh, trained me up. He's been teaching me everything. He texted me the night before. He said, uh, "Win or don't come home." So that's what I woke up to. Was a text. I went to sleep early. And uh, as soon as I got dry enough, I had to go to my truck and get some clothes to dry my phone off. I just replied to him. I was like, "I'm coming home." <laughs> Dude, I mean, Matt, six, 16 pounds, like, congratulations. That, that's absolutely awesome. $2,000 to the winner, over 2000 like, 2373 in some sense. Bait-wise, um, do you have a specific setup you like for the chatterbait? Uh, we're using braid, fluorocarbon, mono. Like, what, what's your setup? Uh, I use St. Croix Legend Tournaments, rods, and uh, Shimano Carados. Uh so I think it's a seven one medium, medium heavy carbon cranker, I think it's called. But I use the chatterbait on 17 pound flora. Wow. Yeah. Because those Color docks get a little sharp. Color wise, were you going with more of a natural color or more of a hot color? So actually in the morning I had a white and chartreuse on. Interesting. Fourth cast, I catch that three and a half pounder. As the time goes by, like 30, 40 minutes go by, 
we're getting in cleaner, cleaner water, these docks, and I can just see this white glowing from 10 feet. And I'm like, in my mind, because I'm not catching another one, I need a, I need a more natural fish. Called, so switch to the old green pumpkin shad. Smart. So smart. And actually, another thing is I threw the, uh, the new Crest City Mayor on it. Hmm. Which a little bit bigger profile paddle tail. Nobody throws it on a chatterbait, so figured I was going to be the first one at Smith Mountain Lake with that setup. And, and was that a three eighths half ounce? Like how big was that chatter half bait? ounce chatterbait? Half ounce. Yeah, I use all half ounces. Were you just slow rolling it, or were you trying to make contact with the bottom? Stay your tree real slow. The whole time. Every time I try to stop it and get cute, I never, never get a bite. It's always. I get bit on just that slow, steady, and she the, just gets tight. The thing of this year to me so far has been about making small changes. Um, I mentioned it on a, I did a live stream a couple weeks ago on Occoquan Reservoir Fountainhead, and we I talked about like in the in the live stream I didn't even realize I said this, but I talked about like just changing colors don't change baits necessarily if you're getting bit on something. And we started with white and then the sun came out and uh, my friend, he switched his glide bait color and then just trucked two more six pounders. And I think it's so interesting because we just get, I don't know what it is about us. Like we just think like, well, clearly it's the swim jig. It's the problem. It's, it's the chatter bait. That's a problem. It's not like, well, no, it's just the color. Everything else is fine. Yeah. And it's so important to be able to make those small changes in the day. Yeah. I don't know why it clicked in my head, but I just, it looked like it was glowing from far away. I was like, it doesn't look, it doesn't look real. And Smith Mountain Lakes, you know, big bait eaters is what, you know, Billy Coles always says. So figured throw a big four and a half inch uh, paddle tail swim bait on it. Worked out good. No, it worked out real good. Um, <laughs> I mean, you've now, I mean, that check pretty much can fund the rest of your, your season for the most part. Um, yeah. So now, so now I'm switched. I got to fish all the Piedmont divisions. I'm trying to guess, you know, in first place, I got to keep going. I'm sorry. You have to travel yeah. so much more now. <laughs> yeah, I know. I'm not looking forward to that high rock one. Dude, that place, people love it or they hate it. it it's like, I looked at it on the map and I was like, is this a pound? Is Why is it small? It's like, I think it's the size of like Anna or a little bit bigger. Like it is small compared to Smith and, um, and Kerr, especially like Kerr is like a monster. I think it's Kerr. Yeah, Kerr's on the schedule. My apologies. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. I like Kerr. Curl will be interesting for you. Um, I feel like, okay, like on the schedule right now, and I can just... So yeah, I'm fishing. Next one I'm fishing is Smith Mountain for the Shenandoah. We got to now. That you got to. Well, I to honestly, was that was my plan to do Shenandoah. I was just fishing the Piedmont because it was in March, and I'm sitting home cold, not fishing. So my first cast of the year was in the tournament, and the fourth cast of the year caught a three-and-a-half pounder. So it was nice. Dude, that's, that is so awesome. I mean, because it, it sucks because up where we live, it's cold. Um, I'm part of the Antietam Bass Masters up in Hagerstown, and our first event of the year was like canceled because it's too cold. I think the river was, I think the river was blown out was the reason. Um, a, a, a Potomac Teams event was canceled recently because of small craft advisories because like right now when we're recording it's this, so it's windy. blowing. It's blowing like a thousand miles an hour. So where we're located, like you really hopefully you can get out like in the early March time, but it's really April when you can get on the water. Yeah. Where I live is the worst place you could live for bass fishing. Really? Oh, well, I do have the Chesapeake Bay besides the Chesapeake Bay. I'm only 20 minutes from that. So that is one good spot. But other than that, it's I'm talking BFL wise Northeast. I don't want to drive to New York every tournament. So I fished the Shenandoahs cause I wanted to try different lakes every tournament. Yeah. No, I, I, I agree with you there a hundred percent. Um, are you, how close are you to Harvey to grace? Like 40 minutes, 30 okay. minutes. What, what part of the bay is the closest for you? Uh, Northeast river. Northeast river. Yeah. Elkton. 28. Perfect. So, you know, like the flats out there, everyone grass fishes right there. How big's your John boat? 14. Oh, that's not too never, bad. I've never taken it out in the bay. No. Oh, you could probably die. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Now, all you got to do is just upgrade that bad boy to like a 15, and then it, you might be able to get out there. Hopefully, I can get a bass boat by the end of the year. So, I mean, you keep winning these tournaments from the back of the boat. But that's the thing, too. Like, like yeah, I, yeah, I do like the co angling stuff. It is fun, but. I've interviewed a My couple of guys. Stuff is like, I want to be the guy catching, you know, big bags. I want the first pick at the dock. I, I, I 100% don't disagree with that. I 100% agree. It, it's, <laughs> but I've, I've, I've interviewed a lot more co-anglers this year. And I realized like, if you throw a chatterbait, a Ned rig, a shaky head and a drop shot, you have a 90% chance of cashing a check. And, and it's kind of crazy when you think of that compared to like the boating side. I, I don't know. Like it, if you could make money, consistently from the co-angler side i can see why people are like i would rather not fish the boater it's cheaper and i can always bank two to three hundred yeah. bucks there's a lot of guys in the co-angler if you click on their name they got 70 80 thousand dollars in winnings and stuff it's nuts absolutely nuts yeah but i don't know it's like i get it now like for these guys these old school guys like what they did is you stay in the back of the boat and you learn your finesse stuff eventually you can almost afford a bass boat with your winnings eventually yeah like and you can just notch right up there and so it's like i don't know my brain is starting to click when you hear these stories like the iconellis who win a boat basically from the back or in a draw tournament and then that's how they fund it and it, it makes sense now in my head so, yeah, really that's another thing i am doing the toyotas as a co-angler so oh dude that's awesome we get a, a win there we get a boat so are are you fishing all of the i'm, I'm assuming it's northern so are you fishing all of them or yeah, that's the game plan. So, well, I'm scheduled for the first one, but let's see how the saltwater world works out once it warms up. So, do you have any saltwater tournaments you're doing this year? <sighs> Not that I know of. No, it's expensive. Well, like I don't, I don't know how much of my audience knows about that. Like, but could you give them a spitball? Like, how much does a saltwater tournament cost compared to like a BFL? Uh, thousands to where. 30, 40,000 to cover the board. The big ones are, you know, up there. Say that again. So it costs like 30 grand to yeah. enter. Some of them are big money, but we, honest. So another, another good thing is uh, people in bass fishing world complain about sonar, four face and sonar. They have no clue what sonar in the saltwater world is. These rich boats have uh, sonar that can see like five to 800 yards in front of them. So when they're driving, they can mark something. Now they can turn towards that mark and troll over there. So it's like $160,000 fish finder. Is it like a live scope or just a sonar to show you that there's a school of bait? It's a sonar. Kind of looks like a radar. So it's just like red marks. You mm. just turn to it. That's Made by Garmin. That's interesting because I've always wondered like, would forward facing sonar ever like play offshore like like it does in bass it's, fishing? Yeah, it's been out before bass fishing sonar. Huh. Yeah, so it's it's the real deal, but it's expensive. Like I said, one hundred sixty thousand just for the setup. So Jeez. it's not worth doing any of these tournaments in the saltwater world unless you have it. Some tournaments now are getting a non sonar category, but. It's fun I, enough just going out on Saturdays and fishing. Uh, you don't need to go in a tournament to waste money. Are there any inshore species, or is it pretty much OC is just Ocean City is just going out to the canyon? No, there's a lot of inshore fishing. A lot of people go. You can just fish real close inshore: flounder, sea bass, tog, sheephead on the rocks by the bridge. There's a bunch of different fish. I didn't think the tog were down this far. I thought that was more of a northern thing. Hmm. You can catch them pretty, uh, like 20 miles, 15, 30 miles in that range out in like a lot of the wrecks and rock piles. Are you getting any cobia up this far? There is cobia, but it's a different style of fishing where you got to like run the beaches and you, you got to spot them from like a tower. We just, we don't do that. So it's not as much as like the Virginia like the, down there, like it's loaded. Virginia Beach. What is the biggest shark you've ever seen or ever caught? Shark? I've caught not a, like by trying to, obviously, but I would say it was like an 800 pound tiger shark. It was, it was giant. It was big enough to where he didn't really know he was hooked. But 
That is a sea yeah, monster. Luckily, swam close enough to the boat, and I got to cut the line. So, how long is an eight hundred pound tiger shark? <laughs> Big, Jesus. Know, nine, ten feet, probably. Good Huge. God! But yeah, there's a lot of sharks in Ocean City. Like I said, I would never jump in, never swim, especially out deep. Is there white sharks up there? Yeah, gray whites, makos, hammerheads. Blue sharks, dusky sharks, all kinds of sharks. Yeah, fine. Nope, Thresher nope, sharks. Nope, 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 nope. Yeah. I've all, I don't know. Like that's it's bad not, enough now that they're starting to eat the tuna as you reel them up. They'll follow boats. I was going to say, I've heard of that in like Florida in the Gulf where like they'll sit underneath the boat and wait for you to reel them up. Yeah, that it's really bad in North Carolina, but they're making their way up to Maryland. Mm, that's frustrating. Yeah. Matt, I mean, I know, it sounds like I'm going to have you on again um, here shortly after you win again. But really looking <laughs> at the schedule here, uh, I, I want to kind of look at this and just kind of like just get, just get your thoughts here. So I'm going to pull up the old Piedmont division uh, and just get your thoughts on what tournament are you looking forward to the most in the Piedmont division going forward and what scares you the most? I like the Kerr, obviously, because I did well there on the chatterbait. So I know she's going to be in play. So it's the same time of the year. I'm kind of scared for the high rock. I've never been there. And then I guess James River, James River on the schedule. Yeah. I, so never, I didn't do good in the James. Smith mountain Lake in March, Kerr in April, April 27th, high rock, June 8th. Then you got the James river, August 3rd, for some reason. I don't know why it's in August. And you got Kerr Lake in September for the Super Tournament. Yeah, I'm excited about the Kerr Lake two-day. Um, yeah, like I said, I was I was really just trying to do the Shenandoah Division. I just did I just did this Smith Mountain Lake because I really like the lake and one of the fish in March. But now that I won, so now I guess I got to fish the Piedmont try to get the O Angler of the Year and all that. Make the what? regional. What happens if you already qualified? What happens if you crank a top ten in Smith Mountain Lake? Because like the I'm looking at though, yeah, because yeah, like well, I'm already in the regional because I won. So oh, true. true now true. I don't. Yeah, it's I'm good. I was thinking more of like an AOI standpoint because it's like yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's like if you crack. Okay, so I guess my point is this: Let's say you crack a top ten at Smith, Potomac, Potomac, James, James. That's the some people would love it. Some people think it's stupid schedule, but does that schedule thing you think line up better for your abilities or do you like the Piedmont schedule more? Mm, I would say Shenandoah is better for my ability. I feel more confident at those lakes, but I'm not going to fish both divisions because it's just uh, it's a lot of Saturdays. I'm usually in Ocean City on Saturdays. So. Honestly, it might be more fun than fishing. Uh, f fishing like BFLs if yeah. I had if I had to pick. I don't but know. I, I was definitely going to commit to one, you know, one division and do the whole series. But now I'm switching to Piedmont. But I love Smith Mountain Lake. I've got to do that at Shenandoah, and I'm probably going to do the Potomac in May for the Shenandoah because I might be doing the Toyota series in June. So get a little extra practice because tuna fishing doesn't start around here until June. So. That's is why there, I try to load up in tournaments, bass fishing before June. Is there any kind of uh, saltwater species running in early spring, like April to June? Maybe some inshore. You want to go sea bass fishing? It's like some bottom fish, which tastes really good. Hmm. But like I said, it's going to be cold, long ride, cold. Interesting. Right on, right on. Matt, I mean, again, th thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. I have a feeling this won't be the, the last time that you're on. Um, yeah. Is there any sponsors that you'd like to, to promote, give a shout out to? Uh, yeah, I'd like to say uh, thank you to X-Zone Lures uh, for this next Smith Mountain. It's going to be probably a bed fishing tournament, so I'm going to be throwing a lot of, you know, X-Zone, Shaggy Head, use their uh, Adrenaline Bug, so, um, also Dirty Murph Bates. Like I said, that's my uh, friend from high school. He's pretty much my mentor. He's been training me up, texting him 20 questions a day. What would you do here? Would you like this? Is this a good idea? What's this? Uh, he does custom crankbaits, custom paint, all that. So, 
he hooks me up with a lot of stuff. He has a lot of stuff, so that's how he got me started. Got me, gave me a lot of tackle to start out with, and pretty much that's it. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. As always, guys, link in the episode description to everything that we talked about. And if you would like to, please join us on Patreon. Our goal is to hit 600 Patreon supporters so we can start our nonprofit, so we can start doing some supplemental stocking of our local fisheries, really help improve some of the boat ramp and facilities for us anglers that the state really doesn't get to. And we have so much more planned as we keep growing. Like and subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time on Fishing the DMV. Bye. You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your host, Thomas Ahrens. Fishing in DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will.